Welcome uh, to a deep adaptation Q&A with me, Professor Jen Bendel, and my guest today is Jelani Cordelia Prescott. She's a classically trained musician, a certified leader and mentor of the dances of Universal Peace International, and a teacher in the Sufi Ruhaniyat International, which is a universal Western Sufi order. Um, you may have seen her uh, because she runs the or offers or hosts the uh, weekly Songs of One Breath, uh, which is um, a song and prayer and meditation offering every Friday, which he does for the in service of the deep adaptation community and other people who are, are interested. So Jelani, thank you very much for, um, for joining us today for this Q&A. Thank you for having me, Jem. Yeah, it's wonderful to uh, it's wonderful to for this to to, to happen because um, um, obviously uh, we had to delay it uh, due to to uh, ill health some months ago, which I think we we might come back to. But um, yeah, I really enjoy what you do, and I really enjoyed your your Sufi uh, session yesterday. Um, I find it very nourishing. So yeah, it's wonderful to host you today. Hmm. So um, I was wondering because. I didn't know um, anything about Sufism or the dances of universal peace uh, at all uh, for a couple until a couple of years ago. So I'm thinking maybe just to sort of provide some context for people who don't know, what what does it mean to be um, doing what you do in the Sufi Ruhani order, and and what is what are the dances of universal peace? Just so that people get some of that context. Uh, potted history or a quick overview. Um, so um, Sufism is sometimes called the path of spiritual freedom. Um, so it's a mystical path. Um, and specifically the, the Sufi Ruhaniyat International draws its lineage um, via Hazrat Inayat Khan, who was an Indian mystic who came to Europe and to America in 1910 and bringing this message of um, unity and diversity that the the uni the, the um, that the truth at the heart of every religion is the same truth so that was his message which he brought um, and one of his students was um, known as Samuel Lewis later Murshid Sam and much, much later in his life, he was a young man when he met um, in Ayat Khan in California. And uh, in the 1960s, after a lifetime of study and work and practice, he um, developed this um, work of the Dances of Universal Peace. He, he was working with the, with the hippies in San Francisco in the 60s. And um, he brought through this this technique or this practice of um, moving, chanting, praying, using sacred phrases with music and movement. So it's a, a fully embodied spiritual practice drawing on sacred phrases from the world's traditions. Um, and that, you know, from, from small beginnings with a small group of students uh, practicing actually in, in, a, in the garage under his house, um, it's now spread to a worldwide movement with teachers in, I think, 40 countries around the world, um, very thriving, um, and um, a huge body of, of work, of, of beautiful dances, melodies, chants. Um, so th this practice evolved initially as part of his, uh, you know, he was a, a Sufi teacher, so that's what, how he um, envisaged this work. Um, the dances have become... Um, independent in their own right so now you don't have to be a Sufi to be a dancer of universal peace and, or to even to teach those dances but uh, they're still very central practices in our Sufi Rahaniyat international so um, that's still the focus of how we it's, it's, it's one branch mm. of how we practice because I maybe like many people uh, when when you hear the word Sufi, you might know nothing, or you might think of whirling dervishes. And but the dances of universal peace. Ha, could you give say something about what what they are in terms of notions of an embodied prayer and song, and and why why do that? Why do that? 
So, I mean, historically, a lot of um, a lot of spiritual practice involves sitting silently, quietly, alone, um, and that's a very important part of of practice. Um, quietening the mind, um, making one's individual connection with the divine or, or whatever one might be thinking of doing in that context. So the, the difference with the Dances of Universal Peace that is that it's a communal practice, it's shared. So we're, uh, you know, holding hands in a circle, moving together. Um, there's something very heart opening about the practice, um, very, very deeply connecting. People feel um, deeply connected to each other. Sometimes the dances are in pairs, in partners, and uh, meeting a sequence of partners, one after another. So we have this opportunity to share spiritual practice with a, with a, a series of people, one to one, face to face, through eyes, through heart, through hands. Um, and so the the mantras that we're singing have their own power, of course, and and um, that's the context, that's the framework of what makes this happen. Um, but in this way, with with um, involving all of the body, um, involving music, involving movement, involving contact with other people, it makes it a very, um, very particular kind of practice, very unusual, and very rare and very precious. You're muted, Jen. Thank you. Um... I want to come back to that because what's happened in in 2020 and and now uh, with with so much going online. But but first, um, deep adaptation. So which is premised on varying levels of anticipation of disruption and collapse, or the experience of disruption in one's life due to environmental change, particularly climate change, uh, and a desire to work with others in a spirit of curiosity, compassion, respect, basically not to just run for the hills or start digging a bunker, but do something collectively. Um, how did you come to discover DA? Um, and what, why did it seem to land with you like as something to engage in? Where, where when was this? Where were you at? How, well, and what's been your journey with DA? Hmm. Well, um, I mean, I want to say it just started with you, Jem, because if you remember, we met um, at a, we were on a weekend course together, and um, I just remember having um, really wonderful and inspiring and exciting conversations with you. But this is a theme that's been very alive with me for really all my life. I, I've been aware of um, environmental crisis and and um, feeling a sense of deep frustration that not that things were not being done that needed to be done to turn this around um so when xr was launched i felt a huge sense of excitement at last something you know a big scale thing happening that i could get behind so i did um join up with them and and um, went to london for the first big demonstration at easter which i think was two years ago is that is that right I've, I've lost the, the plot a bit with the timeline here um so but in in the meantime I, I had met you and um and read your paper and also went through um my own um I suppose a kind of uh, revisiting but also a, a deep um internal personal crisis with um what this meant you know a, a deep sense of um you know, a, a whole roller coaster of emotions of fear and grief, and um, really sort of facing the the situation. So, whilst part of me was wanting desperately to to act and to demonstrate and to um, make people listen, another part of me was also um, uh, very much just coming to terms with it in my own personal sense. Um, so um, then, of course, I mean, shall, shall I just go on? Or um... yeah. So what I'm interested in is is uh, the resonance, if any, with 
your background, your belief system and the work you do. Mm. And the reason I ask is because it was incredible. You, you, <laughs> I remember when uh, you reached out uh, to me and the uh, f- senior facilitator in the Deep Adaptation Forum, Katie Carr, to suggest maybe uh, we consider doing something at a DUP summer camp, Dancers of Universal Peace Camp. And, mm. and we thought, oh, well, maybe. And then, <laughs> and then we show up and the whole camp the whole of the camp is framed as a deep adaptation experience, exploring what this means. And so, so yeah, how, how you got to that point, the, the sense of the resonance being that strong for you um, mm. in both ways, like how does DA, why is DA relevant to your existing community and work and how is your existing work relevant to, to DA? So I was aware that the the community, the the, the dance community in this country, um, in the UK, um, would be very um, open to deep adaptation ideas. Um, I knew that uh, you know these the camps that have been running for thirty odd years now have been very much um, rooted in connection with the earth with environmental sustainability and people's um, love for for the earth for the, for nature for you know for being in touch with that and for 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 taking care of it um, and so it seemed like well i felt I felt clear that it would be fertile ground you know it would be a fertile um, um, meeting between between the camp and, and deep deep adaptation. Um, as far as how how it could go the other way round, um, my own personal experience of the grief and fear and sense of loss that I was going through, having read the your paper, um, really led me to deeply dig deeply into my resources to find support in that. And so all of my my training, my practice, um, which has been so much about being able to reach into a, a larger context for everything um, in which to experience um, life, loss, death, suffering, um, and have some, some reference points, some um, comfort but but a context in which to understand it and to hold it all and so that was you know I found that those resources were there and if if not if that that was so for me then maybe I could be part of helping to share that as well and and which you have been doing um that synergy seemed I seem to remember when we talked about it at the camp, you were saying that you felt the time had come for all the inner resilient, resilience uh, through the spiritual practices and philosophies um, to, to enable people to move into the world more at this time of emergency and disruption to try and, and yeah, to try and populate the movement with some of that ethos and some of that groundedness. I have some recollection of that. And then, of course, through conversations, I invited you to see where, how you could bring some of what you do and offer explicit, specifically to the Deep Adaptation Forum membership with Songs of One Breath. Could you tell us why you do that and, and what, what you mean by Songs of One Breath? So well, I have to give you credit for the title, Jim. <laughs> because we were talking about this. I had a sense, I mean, I think this this arose really as part of the COVID crisis. Um, Maybe we need to spend some time talking about that as well. Um, So um, it was becoming possible to for people to access um, this kind of work um, via Zoom from all over the the world. Um, And it, it felt like a good time to offer extra support. People, many people were isolated, alone at home, um, and to offer a place of connection and very specifically um, I mean the breath the breath is is fundamental to so many spiritual traditions uh, 
I would venture to say it's fundamental to all of this understanding. Um, and so this, I had this strong sense that although we were each isolated in our own homes, that we were still sharing the same breath. And so that by drawing attention to that, that as we sing together, as we breathe together, we could really start to increasingly experience that this this sharing of the breath and that um, even our, our isolation um, is at, at some level illusion because we are not separated um, because at the very most basic level, the breath that we're breathing, my out breath, becomes your in breath and your in your out breath becomes my in breath this sharing in a very real sense you know there's no barrier around the, the entire globe to the movement of breath wind air which is all the same thing thank you and um i have certainly and it's it's just happened to me right now just you hearing you chat about that I brought my attention to my breathing. Uh, therefore, I brought my attention a bit out of my head and into my body. I noticed I've got this sort of, I'm on stage, I must do my job. How is this going type heady energy? And I just check back in with my body and the sense of um, kindness towards myself and and uh, what we're doing here so there is that process isn't there just no just breathing noticing and then the added thing she was saying which is then remembering that this this is as you say one 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 atmosphere that we share um how does that work online um because uh, some people some people are saying that, uh, that, that, you know, wow, if I didn't have Zoom and all this, you know, it'd be much, things would be difficult, but, but it's still not the same as being in a room together. What, what, what do you think, what has been your experience of, of doing this? Um, particularly with this idea then that we're already always completely connected at all times anyway. So I've been really taken by surprise, in fact, um, with what is possible on Zoom. I think I embarked on this, feeling it as um, a poor substitute, you know, a way to keep contact, a way to keep connection, but, but a poor substitute um, for gathering and meeting together in person. Um, but what I've experienced is that increasingly, and I don't think I'm alone in experiencing this, I think um, people who've been meeting in the, in the groups with me have, have also shared that this has been their experience. So increasingly I'm aware of myself in the fullness of my being, so aware of my breath, aware of my energy field, wh whatever that is, but this, um, this physical body is like the, the most dense manifestation of who I am. Um, and there's that has a physical limit, but my jilani ness is not limited to the extent of my physical body. And um, first of all, by following the breath and then increasingly by um, experiencing my sensitivity, my sensitivity to, uh, to and and the meeting between my sensitivity and that of others, that there's a sense that we can really feel each other in some very real way. So the screen is just a screen, okay? Um, but it's a cue, it's a reminder, it's a, it's a, a help point to, it, it's a trigger for, for, those, for those experiences which are actually um, very physical experiences and beyond physical. Um, so I've become in much, much more aware of, of the very real interconnectedness, inseparability of our natures. Um, and that has actually led me to a, a deepening experience of my 
interconnectedness with all that is with with, with all of the planet yeah i am um, i had this chatting with you the other day um where i just realized that um, if I just stopped imagining that all I'm doing is hearing a, a reproduction of your voice and a reproduction of your image, and actually if I almost look away from the screen and just notice again, sitting here in this chair, in this room, right here, right now, I'm having that experience of Jelaniness with me here, about 8,000 miles away from you. <laughs> And and you having an experience of gemness in where you are. It's it's um and then of course from a different cosmology, epistemology, ontology, all those fancy words too, to the one that we're invited to 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 live within by modern society, then that non separability is like, yeah, of course. And so we're all in communion with all of each other all the time on some level and of course then that that's again that's ancient wisdom isn't it prior to zoom we we had prayer <laughs> like let's all just let's all just agree to pray at the same time tomorrow um offline mm -hmm. and there's that sense of of universal togetherness in that way mm -hmm. so um so yeah it's been a interesting technological reminder of an ancient wisdom mm -hmm. and um yeah so um i want to ask you um it's okay not to talk about this and i didn't tell you i would but i know that um there's another way that that reality can inform uh interaction so for example remote healing becomes like an obvious idea from that alternative worldview and I believe you had some of that. So this 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 Zoom was we cancelled it a few months ago because you got COVID, and you were very unwell, and you were having some post-COVID symptoms. Um, can you tell us what happened? Um, I can, but to be strictly accurate, the COVID was actually before that. The the, the um, healing happened because of an operation that I had, which seemed to re-trigger some of that um, mm. fatigue. Um, okay. But yes, so I was really struggling to to heal and to get back um, from that place. And actually, um, Katie Carr suggested she'd been um, she'd, she'd come across this um, healer in Bali and she said she could put put him in touch with me. And I was at the stage of thinking, well, you know, I'll try and try anything. So um, I had this wonderful experience of um, WhatsApp communications, just little text messages with this healer, we would arrange a time and a place and I, I would lie down on my bed for an hour and he would send me healing. Um, and yes, it, it was, uh, you know, it's something that uh, I suppose I've had quite a long journey with with healing. So it wasn't a, um, a huge stretch for me to accept that this could work. Um, but it was certainly the, the longest distance healing that I'd ever experienced, as you say, 8,000 miles. Um, and, you know, it was extraordinary. And I think probably partly because of this experience with Zoom, I, I was more ready to to really tune into that sense of, of our energy fields meeting and, and to, to be aware of, of what he was doing and how he was touching me with, with this healing force. And... Um, uh, yeah, I, I found it very profoundly helpful and uh, had quite a number of sessions with him and and, and ended up be recovering completely. So, mm. yeah, and uh, and that's I understand, of course, that there may be other factors and some people will be thinking, oh, but, you know, could it be just coincidence? But I seem to be hearing quite quite a lot of stories very similar. Um, and so it's fascinating to me. Um, and if that is the case, then that invites us to think quite radically differently about how change may or may not happen and how we may or may not wish to show up in the world moment by moment, day by day on something like the environmental predicament. And 
And it does bring us to this idea then that there could be some kind of spiritual activism. Um, I was wondering, do any of the ideas work for you? Notions of how, yeah, this notion of spiritual activism or um, other forms of, of healing um, each other and our relationship to the natural world um, through things which might be labeled mysticist, mystic approaches. Mm. So I think one thing that feels really important is, is um, that I've learned is this embodied sense of the impact that I as an individual can have. Um, and, you know, that can happen, that can be at a very um, um, sort of fundamental um, level to do, you know, we're, we're educated to believe ourselves to be so individual and so separate. Um, and so it's hard for people even to appreciate, like with with our individual impact on the climate, for example, you know, it's hard to see f for many people to understand that. Um, obviously, some people have thought about it a lot. Um, so um, to be able to move not only to from experiencing the impact that that I might personally be responsible for in in a negative sense in the world to also the impact that I could be responsible for having in a positive sense um, and I think maybe this is what you mean by by spiritual activism and, and I certainly think that um, you know again it's something that we've done over zoom um, around the uh, around the world um, is a sense of holding the earth in in loving healing um, and a sense of um, really uh, really grasping at, at, a, at a deep body level that I am not separate from the earth. This is not about me um, sending healing to something else. It's like each one of us, we, we are all part of this and, and we're not separate from each other. We're not separate from the earth. There's no way that we can actually, you know, take ourselves out of this, this interconnected system. Um, and so to one of the wonderful things about doing that as you mentioned prayer but and there's a there's a very visual sense when we do it on zoom um for me it, it might, makes it much easier to experience this because i might be aware that i've got somebody on the screen in bali somebody in california somebody in hawaii somebody in you know britain you know and and there we are literally encircling the globe and if our, uh, you know, if our usness, if um, is is connecting in that way that we described, my Jelaniness meeting gems, gemness, um, all around the world, we are literally holding and bathing the earth in this in this circle of our energy field, and therefore, what we put into that energy field is is bathing that whole globe. Um, so if we're doing that with a sense of greater unity, greater inner peace, greater um, loving, healing intention, you know, it, it's going to be felt at some level. Yes, and in my case, I feel it in, in a sense of restoring a feeling of rightness despite everything. Like, it's it's right to be awake to the troubles. It's white, right to be um, doing stuff cat-handedly in response to those troubles, even if it causes, you know, difficulties and stresses. There's a deeper rightness, even uh, no matter what's happening. And uh, yeah, I find I find that from the coming back to the these these bigger questions of what is reality who am i why are we here all that and and then and also rather than just the heady stuff then the, the actual experiential sense of shared beingness usness 
Um, how do we avoid spiritual bypass in uh, in this, that people will just sort of reach for this in their stressy panic at the way the world is and therefore just do a little bit of recycling and spend the rest of their time hanging out in Sufi circles online? Yeah, and saying, oh, it's all good. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, well, again, I think, I think the, the breath is the key because uh, if we follow the journey of the breath if we really are committed to to experiencing this shared breath to really opening and deepening our awareness of what that means so that you know more and more day by day i can really be connected with people all around the globe with plants and animals all around the globe through my breath aware that this is shared that we're this is this experience that we are going through at the moment is something that we are all in together um, and then when I follow the breath in because every breath has to come in as well as out and so when that lands in me what do I find in there in response to what I'm learning and experiencing and when I really go deep with that when I let the breath take me into contact with my feelings when I let it let me let down some of the guards, some of the, you know, you were describing this earlier in the call, Gem, that sort of um, sense of, you know, it, it can be a bit of rigidity, a bit of um, mental patterns, a bit of um, holding on, keep, keeping going, coping, uh, a sort of, there's a, there's a line here but below which it, we don't go and then, oh, when I let the breath take me below that line and I feel feel into what's actually going on inside me, I can touch the fear, the grief. Um, I can touch all of it. I can feel everything more deeply. I can feel the deep joy of loving connection, the, the, the intense experience of being in nature. Um, and... Um, So I've lost my thread a bit here, Jem. You might have to help me where we were going. I, what I'm hearing is that um, the, the practices that you have, so for example, the returning to the breath, uh, tuning into your emotions and what's happening, sensations in the body, this can help you stay present to the full difficulty um, because you're becoming okay with all those difficult emotions so you're not running away from it with the habits of the brain the busyness all these secondary concerns um, and therefore why were you telling me that about in response to spiritual bypass it's that this doesn't need to be it's about escape and feeling good this can actually be about the capability to stay with what's bad and what yeah. feels bad and then it's about also being able to find the nourishment um you know often um what feels bad um why is it so difficult to deal with you know and maybe there's a an, a sense that um an ideal human possibly could be perfectly okay with with living with dying with suffering without being um troubled by that that's not my experience is not the experience of most of us. We are troubled by these things. So, but, so what's that about? And the exploration of that and finding um, ever more understanding of, of the, 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 you know, we talk about the hungry places inside, the hungry ghosts and, and what are our fears, our you know, scarcity and loss and lack and um, our longing to be loved and our longing to be seen and all of these things. And when uh, the more that we can deepen into all of that and find a context for all of that and find, um, find the nourishment for that, which mainly comes through deep loving connection, either with other human beings or with 
the, the earth or with the divine. And in, in my feeling, there's actually no difference between these things. We can access them all, um, whichever entry point we, we take. Um, and so building that, that sense of, of, a, of a strong container for all of our experience then enables us yeah, to, to be more fully present um, more you know, more with these these things the, these difficulties and able then to act when the time is to act as well because for me it's not about um, an either or it's it's like it's a both and sometimes mm -hmm. it's the right time to be to be um, going within to be um, it's always the right time to be with the breath but uh, sometimes it's the right time to be sitting on the cushion alone in silence sometimes it's the time to be reaching out connecting with others and sometimes it's the time to be out on the streets um, demonstrating and making ourselves heard even without permission eh yeah <laughs> <laughs> who gives permission the right the right the right to protest is not meant to be a privilege to protest but uh, there we go strange times we live in um so uh, I just want to say to everyone, um, please do consider, if you have a question for Jelani, to send it to uh, Matthew. Um, you'll find him as questions here, please. Send him, and then uh, and then you can, uh, yeah, then he'll he'll bring bring you to uh, to talk. Um, we're in a moment going to go to uh, to Madhu with a question, and um, but before then, just to give you some notice, Madhu, um, one more question, Jelani. I reread your blog that you wrote uh, back in May last year about restoring ancient wisdom in the context of anticipation of disruption and collapse. And, um, and you covered some of these topics. But one thing you said was restoring the wisdom of the wisdom that's found within religions doesn't mean um, turning to religious structures and institutions. Um, I don't know if you've given this much thought, but uh, the you know seven billion people on the planet in a really tight squeeze, uh, things are going to get really difficult. And obviously, religions are the things that many people turn to, or think that other people are turning to when people feel vulnerable or feel mortality or grief. Um, it's highly likely that religion will be looked to by many people. What do we do about that? How do we how do we encourage right relationship with religion between religion? Um, yeah, how, what can we do if anything about about how how those religious institutions respond to these 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 times? And that's a question to everyone on this call, by the way, because it's pretty damn tough. <laughs> mm, it's a huge question, Jim. It's a huge one. I mean. Um... On one level, I think that all I can do is um, share my truth, be my truth, um, encourage the people that I meet to, to be their truth. Um, I mean, the, the reality is that many of us have been scarred by religion. Um, if we weren't ourselves personally, then our parents may have been and they may have thrown it out. So we were brought up without any religion. Um, so the, you know, the, the structures, um, the, the often deeply patriarchal structures of organized religion have been responsible for some of the, the most heinous crimes around the world and, um, and have had the result in, in our day of alienating very many people. Um, they still also are responsible for perpetuating senses of otherness and um, right and wrong. And, it, you know, I say that, I hear myself say that, I think, well, of course it's about right and wrong, isn't it? Um, I'm, the way, where I'm going with this at the moment is that it's never as simple as, as right and it's, wrong. It's all about love and not yet love. Exactly. <laughs> there we go. Yes. Um, if we, uh, just to call on the, um, the Aramaic words of, of Jesus, if you look at his original language where he spoke, um, he didn't have the word for sin. Um, he had a word which meant unripe. So, um, it, it, yeah, the whole of Christianity based on unripe or ripe action. Mm. Yes, it was just an invitation for us all to get a little bit more fruity. <laughs> 
So I, th I think that um, the, you know, for, for me, what's, what's been fundamental to, to who I am is this individual, personal, mystical experience, which I feel is what was there at the, at the beginning of every religion. Um, I think every um, visionary mystic and prophet had this sense of, a, of an individual connection with the divine, had a, a personal message that they wanted to share about that, um, which has enormous strength and beauty and gifts for, for all people. And um, along the way, these messages get um, bound up in in structures that are about organization and personality and power and and the message can get lost in that um, so that's for me what has been the the beauty of of the universal western sufism of hazrat inayat khan the, the pointing to really going back to the truth that was what what was the seed for each of these religions and it's and it's the same wherever you look mm. it's as you say it's about love it's about breath it's about unity it's a, um, those messages are there it, wherever you look so in one sense if you find yourself in a religious structure that you're happy to be in then then wonderful just keep looking for the love and the breath and the connection and the unity through that yeah. And just be a little bit careful with any stories about my unity is better than your unity. <laughs> um, all right, so we're going to go to, uh, by the way, everyone, please send questions to Matthew. Uh, Madhu, if your question, please unmute yourself. Also, maybe lean into the camera a bit so we will be able to see you a bit better than I can see you at the moment. Oh, yeah. Hello. Uh, yes. Uh, really, this question comes with um, a lot of inner struggle over many years. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, we can hear you, Madhu. Okay, wonderful. Uh, it's, it, it's about, you know, our own inner work, and you've been talking about the breath. Um, it's very personal work. And... I'm just thinking also, what about, uh, you know, there are many, many people in the world, maybe increasing now who do do this in their work, but there are so many people, there's a huge proportion on the earth who don't connect deeply with their breath and live in unawareness and materialism. We all have that to a certain level, but there are many who have an extreme level of that. Then you've got all the food, water, climate, chemicals, allopathic medicine, um, poverty, inequity of the rich and poor. And um, sometimes I feel very hopeless. Uh, there is inner work going on, but then there's the struggle of life as well, you know, uh, making a living, whatever else uh, people are all contending with, the um, strictures on life, all the rules and whatever. And uh, sometimes you feel very alone. And um, it just feels, but then I look on um, the internet sometimes and there seem to be many, many brave souls doing a lot of work and bringing out everything to uh, you know the society. But it still feels like nothing ever happens very much. And I'm just wondering, what is there anything, or do we just carry on like this? Is there anything uh, that you know all these people who are doing incredible work can get together? And it seems to me that it can only happen through internet. Or do we just carry on just doing our personal mm. work? You know what? Thank you. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. That the scale and the scale of the challenge mm. and things have trends going in the wrong direction in many ways and yet lots of people doing lots of good things but it doesn't it seems to be swimming against a tide so what do we do about it if anything where does yeah how do you respond to that is, is that the way you see things Jelani and how and how do you respond to it if you do see things that way it's a really hard question isn't it and it's um it's easy to, to feel quite depressed about that. Um, I think this is where it perhaps does come back to the personal um, 
a sort of sense of, of acceptance as well, a sense that um, even if even if I'm not able to affect or change anybody or anything in the world, this is still the best way for me to develop a sense of equanimity, to, to develop my inner peace that is not dependent on external circumstances. Um, and I think there's, a, there's an inherent paradox in here that um, it's important that we, um, we strive, that we have this um, passion for, a, for the goal of, you know, living in the, of creating the best world we possibly can, um, but also having an equanimity with whatever the outcome is. Um, as I say, one of, one of these teachings which we find in so many traditions is that, and, and this is, you know, we talked about ancient wisdom, that was the title of my blog, and um, I think going back since the dawn of time, the nature of being a human has to be, has been to be in struggle, in struggle with um, scarcity of, of food and resources often, with sickness, with, you know, with death and um, general challenges of just being alive you know we might translate those into slightly different formats and in, in our modern day you know um, with modern medicine and 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 you know different there there are different challenges now but they're still just as as many challenges and just as challenging as they've always been and so the the same wisdoms apply that um yes we we work to to make the best world we can um we work to to make this to make friends with our breath so that i so that i can be um connected with how i'm being affected by what's happening around me um so that i can feel that um and you know by by being the most grounded centered authentic feeling and um, peaceful as I can be, then I bring that with me when I, where I go. I mean, I, I really know, I really see the difference when I manage that and when I don't manage that. Um, and so that seems to me to be the work and the way forwards is that we are, um, each one of us doing what we can and sharing it. Yeah, yeah, it's it's thank you for the reminder of of that it's important work to be to be who we are, to 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 come from a place of love and forgiveness, including if it doesn't add up to what we would wish it to add up to. Um Yeah, so thanks for that. Uh Katie, I guess Katie Carr, uh question. Thank you. Yeah, um, we have read a lot in the last very, very difficult 12 months about the ways in which spiritual communities and members of spiritual communities have been particularly swayed by or susceptible to um, conspiracy theories about world events. And I'm wondering what your observations on this are and also what might be the responsibilities of spiritual or faith community leaders in this regard. Mm. I agree it's been um, deeply concerning actually to, to see those trends and to see how um, in, in many of the communities that, are, that I'm in touch with, you know, people who have always identified themselves as kind of earth loving hippies have have sort of been um yeah have, have managed to to fall down these conspiracy rabbit holes as far as i i can see it and i feel um personally i i have a huge responsibility um to hold a, a sense of grounded sensibleness <laughs> 
there's, I'm not sure if this is apocryphal, but um, I've been told that Hazrat Inayat Khan once said, avoid all nonsense. And it seems like really good advice to me. <laughs> but um, how, how do we... Um, how do we know what what is nonsense? I mean, I feel a personal sense uh, to, um, need to um, to to do my research, to um, to th- you know think sensibly about things, to, and and to check it out in my body in in terms of mm, does this land as as seeming like wise, sensible advice or or not? Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I don't know how we how we avoid it happening, but I, I think that I, there's been some very interesting um, papers out recently um, around the vulnerability of people who are attracted to certain spiritual groups and, and then therefore, in my sense, the huge responsibility that leaders and teachers have to be aware of, of those vulnerabilities um, particularly trauma and um, the effect that that can have on on people's um, yeah need to to feel um, a strong teacher or a strong holding parental type type presence and then their vulnerability to being led in ways which are not always helpful so um, I think it's a huge a huge responsibility that we all need to be aware of not sure that's a very helpful answer, but did it? Do you feel like it answered your question, Katie? Is that any more you'd like to say about that? Yeah, it did. There's only one other part of it for me, which is it has really brought my awareness to the fact that um, my experience of the society that I've been brought up as part of is very, very, it's easy to feel very lonely. Um, You know, the absence of that sense of belonging and holding and trust compared to uh, societies that I am close enough to be able to feel that outside of Europe. Um, And that that seems to me an antidote to the kind of desperate panic. We need to know something that feels certain, that feels safe. yeah, so that's been an important part of it for me. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I missed all that because um, my internet dropped out, but um, I look forward to seeing the recording on, on YouTube to hear what, what you were sharing. But yeah, it's, it's definitely in my world too. Um, it's actually for me the same effect, the same process happening in those people who decide not to think and just do what they're told by a chief medical officer and a politician uh, and mainstream or corporate media. Um, and those people who <laughs> who decide to reject everything and just go with whatever seems most fascinating and exciting and sort of almost like the, the, the way to just dismiss everything. It's like a desire for simplicity and not wanting to stay with complexity. So on one hand, you 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 end up agreeing with really strange and decisions by governments which then they contradict themselves later anyway, and do it something else. Or you go and end up believing that Bill Gates wants to inject your children with nanobots. It's like, I think it's maybe the same processes that are happening by both ends, both extremes. Um, I want to say, um, so Katie, actually, uh, thank you for the question. Everyone, Katie works with the Deep Adaptation Forum. I don't anymore. Um, I left in September and I left the board uh, uh, over a month ago. But um, they're doing amazing work that also Jelani is in support of with with, with those weekly uh, activities. Um, so I'll put a link into the YouTube notes um, for a fundraising drive that the Deep Adaptation Forum is doing. Basically, they need about 100 or more new donors of, of any amount of giving by uh, the end of March in order for to unlock quite a nice match funding. Uh, from a from a private donor so I'll, I'll put in a link for that also you can just always at any time go to deepadaptation.info and read blogs find out what's happening 
um, even decide to contribute a blog because they're also wanting to pluralize the voices and the experiences with DA around the world. Final question, because we're going to go a few minutes over because we started a few minutes late. Um, Chloe, uh, it needs to be a, a, a quick question because we've got to, got to hear the answer and everything within less than five minutes. Thanks. Hi, Jilani. Hi, Chloe. What are the qualities that have developed in you as a result of your spiritual practice that have helped you to be with the enormity and pain of the current crisis and help you to be with it and not turn away? Well, that's quite a nice wrap up question, isn't it? Basically, the essence, almost like a essential oil of, of everything we've been talking about. Mm, mm, mm. So I would like to say I'm very much a work in progress. Um, but I think what has developed in me increasingly is um, the image I get is of a mountain, a, a sense of stability, groundedness, rootedness, able to, um, and uh, you know, sometimes this is an aspiration more than a reality, but uh, sometimes it's available to me. An, an ability to to allow the weather to move around me um, and still to maintain my grounded rootedness in the earth, my sense of my own safety and stability independent of what else is happening. And also, um, yeah, I mean, the, the ultimate you know, if if we follow this investigation of unity, non-separability, um, then that also extends forwards and backwards in time. So then this lifetime starts to feel um, less all-encompassing and more of a of a part of a of a whole. And um, so sometimes I'm also able to look ahead and feel myself, feel my bones being absorbed back into the earth at the end of my life and and feel that that's okay, that there's a, you know, there's a sense of my first breath and my last breath, where I come, came from, where I'm going to, and somehow all of that contained in, in all that is. And that brings a, a sense of peace. Thank you. Um, so we're ending with not ending here, but this sort of momentary eternal experience we're having comes to an end. All right. Um, sorry for those of you who uh, sent questions to Matthew. Um, basically, no one really sent any questions to the last 15 minutes. So I had to just keep asking questions of Jelani. So we ran out of time. Um, but you can see Jelani, I guess, next Friday, 2.30 p.m. UK time. Um, if you want to know about that, then um, the best way is on the Facebook group. But Jelani, is there another link that you could mention um, for people to easily find Songs of One Breath or your other work? So um, I should have thought about this. Uh, I mean, I, there's a Facebook page, which is Jelani and Salik, um, and th these events are on there as well as the as well mm -hmm. as the Deep Adaptation Facebook group. Okay, I'll put that in the uh, I'll put that in the notes as well on the YouTube. So my it's my YouTube channel. Just look for Jem Bendel in YouTube, and then you'll find it, and then you'll find this video. Uh, and in the show is it show notes? Not really a show, is it? In the video notes all these links. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Jelani. Thank you, Jim. May all beings be well. May all beings be happy. <laughs> peace, 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 peace. peace.